Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us, Dan. Uh, maybe you can give us a brief intro to your film, Lad uh, Yorkshire Story. Uh, Lad Yorkshire Story is a coming of age film about a teenage boy called Tom Proctor, who, um, whose father sadly passes away. And as he starts to lose his way in life and as his family struggle in the aftermath, he's partnered with a park ranger and it's really a, a sort of a, a very moving coming of age story about how that friendship helps him to come to terms with his loss. And um, yeah, a, a coming of age classic is what, is what we aspire to be. Yeah. And I know this is not, you know, just a true story, but your true story that it's sort of based on. So what was kind of the, the, the thing that prompted you to go back and revisit, you know, this relationship you had with this ranger back from when you were young and, and make it into your, your feature debut? Um, at the time of at the time that it came about, it was several years after I'd made a short film, and the person I'd made that short film with kept asking me about this relationship I'd had, or or what was essentially the germs of the story. Um, my my owl, as in the park ranger who was my mentor, um, was a very big influence for me when I was about fifteen or sixteen, and I used to spend all my spare time volunteering with him. And I think she just saw the germs of something in that story and she kept asking about it. And then eventually uh, that grew and other people were asking me about it. And it just seemed like, um, you know, there was something very poignant uh, to tell and obviously very personal. And, and I emigrated to Australia when I was 16. So it, it was sort of my way of reconnecting with the place that I'd grown up. And, and, I, and I guess it was a pathway to that. Yeah. And I understand, you know, you kind of, really did go back and revisit your roots and even actually, you know, recruit your cast from people in the local community, like non-professional actors and things. So what was that process like? And, you know, was that quite like uh, gratifying for you personally to, to revisit your childhood and, and those amazing locations uh, as we see in the film? Yeah, it, it was an absolute dream because I had not been living there for some time. I'd been moved to London after, well, I'd, I did uni in, in Newcastle and then I'd been in London. So I hadn't lived in the area for a long time. I was very wary of making something that didn't feel connected or honest. So I actually started casting the film prior to even writing the script because I wanted it to have that sense of authenticity. So I workshopped the film. It, it, I, it obviously, well, many of your viewers might know of Mike Lee's process, but he basically starts a project with just a room full of actors and they talk and talk and six months later they sort of have devised their characters and come up with a storyline and when we took something like that approach we had the bare bones but it was really through casting these amazing uh, real life actors from the community and then workshopping them and having the interplay between them inform how the storyline developed that really did make it sort of very special from a storytelling perspective but also a real treat for me because I, I really got to live back um, in the place that I absolutely adore and and to, to do so as part of the community, which was, yeah. which was pretty neat. And did it feel like a risk, you know, to take on people and non-professional actors? I mean, obviously it really paid off, you know, especially that young Tom who plays the character so well, but also his relationship um, with the ranger and, and particularly with his mother as well. So what was it like, did it feel risky and, and what was it like to see that kind of really pay off on screen? I don't think there's ever a feeling of risk when you come out of an audition and you've been mesmerized by the performance. I mean, I have um, on, on my, I'm not sure it's on my website, but certainly on the Facebook page, I've sort of put up the original showreel video compared with how it looks in the film. And, and you know, it, without suggesting I don't do anything, a lot of what is amazing uh, or what, what I think is amazing, what people react to in the film is is the authenticity of, of their performances. And, and they just have that. And when you meet someone and they are just super special, then there's no fear or sense that it will go wrong. There's just a real excitement at being on the journey with them and, and seeing, uh, I don't know, just, just um, being captivated by them, really. You kind of just, uh, I mean, he was, uh, Tom, who was played by Bretton Lord in particular, was just, a thoroughly charismatic kid and you know he remains a really good friend to this day and there's, there's a whole you know we, we've spent many years together uh since but he's he, he was just brilliant mm. 
And talk to me about the process of this film making its way, you know, on onto Amazon, because it was kind of a, a, a non-conventional route that it took as well to, to reach people's screens. I, think, I understand it was kind of a bit of a sleeper hit, you know, finding an audience, first of all, on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it wasn't a film that was picked up. It was a film that people, um, they liked and admired it, but they didn't see an audience for it. And, I, and I'd have comments like, well, we think it will play really well in Yorkshire, but we're not really sure it will travel. And the industry just didn't seem to um, understand it, it was in, in simple terms. I, and yet I did tour it around festivals and I took it around the world and I took it on a tour of all the national parks in the country. And I could see the audience response wherever I went. And I knew that there was, you know, I knew that there was something there that people were responding to. But as time went on, obviously, you get to a point and you think, I don't know, two years have passed, three years have passed. I, it might not even be that I'm wrong. It might just be that this won't happen simply. And, and it kind of was going that way. And it was only through, you know, I had a deal with a distributor in, in America, just a very small outfit. Um, they, you know, they didn't uh, buy the film. They just took the rights for it. And we were supposed to, you know, eventually get some, some um, income from it. But basically they just, they released it on YouTube. Um, they, I mean, they gave it away on YouTube essentially, but and I didn't know about it. And it was some months later and I was on a film set because I, I work as a technician and I just was, I was getting an email through one day and then another day and then several more. And then it, it just sort of grew and grew. And I found it and it was on YouTube and, and hundreds of thousands of people had watched it. And I looked through the comments and there was comments from people in Mexico and India and all around the world, just really, really loving the film. And it gave me a renewed sort of sense that, well, I, you know, I, I always felt a degree of responsibility to make sure that it did get out into the world. But it, it has been a very slow burner sleeper hit. Um, and it's really just accelerated over the last uh, year and particularly in lockdown, so much so that we'd, we've had hundreds of thousands of downloads on Amazon now. And it's, I think word of mouth really over time has just built and built and hopefully that just continues and, and it will get its sort of day in, day in the sun. Yeah. And do you think in that sense, obviously the pandemic has been ruinous for, for a lot of the industry and, and, you know, quite sadly for a lot of parts of, of our cultural institutions, but maybe there is a, a good side to this, which is smaller films um, are finding an audience in kind of these other routes and people are looking for stuff to watch in lockdown and maybe connecting with material they might not do otherwise. So do you think that's kind of a positive story and all of that for, for the outcomes of the lockdown and pandemic and stuff? Yeah, I think it, we've certainly benefited from people maybe being a little more adventurous in what they might choose to view and having more time. Um, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to look at this time and, and think of it in any sort of advantageous time because so many people have had such, such tough times and, um, you know, I was there with my family last year for the first lockdown and five months into it, we're thinking, I don't know, if this continues, we, you know, we're, we've got real problems here. But I think what, what always shows is that a universal story of, of sort of courage and community resilience will find its way. Uh, we always, you know, we, we need those stories and we respond to those stories. And what I suppose has been good is that finally they've gotten a little, we're getting a little more headway against the big juggernauts, the Marvels, the Star Wars, the other films who aren't releasing at the moment. So yes, it has given, you know, a little bit more of a window for us to, to shine. And I think that's really good. And, and the response has always been from a British audience that we want these films. We, you know, we like a simple, honest, homegrown film. And, and the problem is that I think has been in the distribution chain, I think, it's it's sort of choked up by the heavyweights, mm -hmm. um, but the and and therefore, you know, the streaming platforms are helping redress that balance. But I, I think we can still go further, you know, from our institutional standpoint to support those releases. You know, I'd, I'd like to see that happening. Um, mm. And do you find it interesting on reflection, actually thinking that originally the reason was they thought it wouldn't appeal to people like you know outside of Yorkshire, because you know when you watch that film 
it is a stunning, stunning place. And like you say, kind of the authenticity of the characters and perhaps going into that detail of what life is really like, you know, down to the, I don't know, the dry, dry stone walling competition and these kind of idiosyncrasies to, to living there actually is something that a lot of people can enjoy watching. And then the characters are something, uh, are those that people can really relate to. So like you say, there is a universality and an and appeal uh, to the story. Yeah, I, I I found that always to be a very absurd and, and sort of trite uh, presumption. Uh, it certainly um, isn't. Yeah, you know, I, I watch French films because I enjoy seeing how the French people live and uh, film travels. We are inquisitive people with shared experiences. So the idea that we'd only want to watch stories set within a fifty mile radius is is um, makes no sense to me. Yeah. Are you actually uh, an expert at drystone hauling? <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> I don't think I ever participated in drystone hauling. I did build the style. If you um, remember that point where uh, Tom's getting a little shirty because he's been asked to saw wood, I, I took great pleasure in making those styles with with Al, and uh, very fondly remember that. Hmm. But yeah, and it, what do you think some of the themes are then that that come out of it that do make it so appealing? Because some of it is quite tough you know thinking about a young kid losing his father and you know eventually having to be wrenched away from from Al as well but there's some there's great meaning I think to be taken and there's a great positivity actually to to the outcome of the story as well so it's mm. kind of got that sadness but also got a really positive outlook. Yeah I was certainly inspired by some great films we've made in England such as The Full Monty and Brastoff and Films that that show the drama of, of uh, you know tough life experiences, but also the the humor and the courage and the kindness. Um, I think these are all aspects that we Brits are very um, passionate about. So I, I really wanted to capture that full spread. But it, it was interesting to take tackling a story about bereavement in particular because I've you know very fortunately not had a great deal um, of of people close to me that have passed so what was interesting was when when we took it to child bereavement a charity and they screened it it was this sense that there's so often a secondary loss when you have a bereavement it's not just and only the first uh, sudden death of someone it's then the ripple effect afterwards and the the brother who in this story you know he struggles and has his own response they said it was such a common sort of thing and and that was you know, that just instinctively came about through creating the film, but I, I think I learned um, some more sort of universal universality about bereavement and um, yeah, it, it was a journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, I think I've probably not answered the question entirely, but um, uh, themes of courage and, and loss. And, and perhaps this element as well of, you know, kind of class struggle and actually how much uh, you know, something like this can knock uh, a working class family, you know, off kilter. And, you know, the fact that they're struggling to hold on to their house and you know, when she drives up in the truck to the to the, the banker's home, it's kind of like a brilliant moment of that coming face to face. So do you think that was another element you wanted to bring out? Kind of the everyday struggle that people can be faced with, but then also the resilience of, of people such as and families such as that. I think that in crafting the story and integrating parts of my own upbringing, that that scene just was absolutely rooted in an experience we had in, in 1989, where my dad, who owned a small uh, shop in the Yorkshire Dales, was threatened with uh, foreclosure by the bank. They wanted to pull back the loans after one of those sort of cyclical uh, financial crises. And we were gathered around the table and told, this, this might be it. We, you know, we, we think we have to sell the house and go. So I've had that experience and, and, you know, what was nice, I suppose, was to tell a story in which through the convictions of, of mom and, um, you know, her, she just wasn't going to let that, she was wasn't going to let it stand. And it was so joyful to see how she then took that mantle on and, and, and how her story paralleled the lad's story and, you know, we will, we, we tackle adversity every day in so many ways and the pandemic's a massive version of that, but 
um, people are, you know, people are brave and tough. Uh, and yet institutions are, are heartless and cruel. Mm. So, you know, to tell that story, but also to have humor and mirth is mm. was really important. Mm. And I guess that could actually have a lot of resonance with people right now, because there's probably going to be even more people who are struggling, um, but hopefully will come out the end of this and, and you know, come out the other side. Yeah, I, 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 I'm always thinking of all these industries that are still shut at this point in time and how brutal that must be. We've had a mixed bag in the film industry. As I said, I work as a technician. So we, you know, most of last year was, was not working. A lot of this year we've been able to work. Uh, so I, I've had sort of both experiences. And at times when I wasn't working, I could see some of my friends that were. And now that I am, I see some that aren't. And um, it's, yeah, it, it's going to be, um, it's really challenging. Uh, and, but I hope that at least some of the experiences we have had from lockdowns uh, help to to move us towards a sort of I don't know a, a, a psyche that is at least has kindness as a, a central tenet uh, I guess and what do you hope for the film's journey from now on I guess that it just gets even more traction on Amazon do you hope that one day people will get to see it in the cinema see when things um, yeah, I mean, from about year two or three after it was finished, we just started saying, oh, I just started hearing rather, well, you know, maybe it'll be one of those films that 10 years down the line gets re-released and then people discover it. Uh, I think that's as close as I come to a strategy as there is, really. I, I can only hope that we snowball and, and, and make our mark because the reaction from everyone who I see sort of interacting with the film via reviews or, or emails that we get is is so overwhelmingly positive that I'd be very um, you know I'd be very hopeful of a, a cinema release being being quite successful and you know and I'd, I'd hope we could get people into the cinema to see it. Yeah. And can you tell us what you're going to work on next or are you, are you currently working on something now and you've got the next film? As a crew member I'm probably not allowed to say what I'm working on because there's probably a, a pretty uh, rudimentary, or not rudimentary, pretty um, severe NDA at the start of it, but um, I have worked on numerous studio films. I'm on one at the moment, but I'm developing, um, I, I have a couple of documentaries in the works, one with a um, some people from my past, uh, some of the Harry Potter people, which is very exciting. And then um, I have another documentary actually with Breton, the lead from uh, Lad, who's a, a very enterprising uh, young man today. And then I have a, a TV series and a feature film in the works. So, um, you know, for anyone who's who's listening and uh, fancies themselves as a producer, do come knocking because I want to I want to get back behind the camera. Yeah, brilliant. Well, it's definitely got um, a lot on your plate, it sounds like. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing all that with us and for this wonderful film, which I found really moving, but funny and, you know, just I actually went to university in Leeds and sort of remember how much I loved the, the Yorkshire countryside. So it was great to be kind of immersed in that. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much.